Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with John Rusk of EMP EDC. At this point, most of you know the Nimble, EMP EDC's flagship folder platform. The Nimble boasts a wide variety of materials, builds, and blade shapes across its growing product line and is wildly uh, popular among knife users and collectors. You also may know the uh, the equally robust and charming Thick Boy. That's that's the one. That's the one that has really caught my eye. Something about that design is so beautiful. I met John at Blade Show 2022, and he told me that when he started EMP EDC, he was in a bit of a pinch. And I would say uh, from this perspective, uh, he's used that urgency uh, of that situation to turn his passion into a promising career. And that's good for all of us. We'll meet John and find out all about EMP EDC in just a moment. Uh, but first, I'd like you to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell and download the show to your favorite podcast apps so you can listen on the go. And as always, join us on Patreon if you have the means and the uh, and the inclination Go join us there. You get uh, entered into knife giveaways. You get stickers, exclusive content. That's the most exciting stuff. Uh, not only extras for these interviews, but some other uh, knife demos and stuff like that. Uh, quickest way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and check out our three levels of support. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Hi, John. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, congratulations on your success. You've uh, you haven't been around long. EMP EDC is not an old company, but no. man, you have hit with a splash, and uh, I want to congratulate you on that. Thanks. So we're coming right up on two years. Actually, in September, it'll be two entire years since we opened the site. A little little longer to, than two years since we started started the journey. Um, but it, it, it's been crazy because I, I heard you mention there, yes, we we're in a bit of a pinch uh, when EMP EDC kind of came to be a thing. Um, I had, you know, we we're in the middle of that pandemic back in 2020. And um, I had a really nice cushy job with Target of all places. And um, it just didn't go so well <laughs> with all that going on. And um, so I found myself in need of new employment. And I decided for, you know, hey, I'm going to try to my, do my own thing, make my own employment. Um, and so uh, we took took the what savings that we did have and decided to open up. Uh, originally, the idea was actually to just be like an online knife at EDC retailer. Um, that's kind of how how the whole I in every man's pocket, but even the name and everything kind of came to be. Uh, and then in the search for products, we came across um, the Slenderman, probably the, the first knife that, that people know was just a collaboration. Like I did not design this knife. Um, I just got the pieces in separate, fit them together, kind of fine tune things, um, and then launch with this product. And then as we were looking for other knives to sell, I was contacting like QSP, Best Tech, and just pricing out things. And I had just on a whim asked the companies, hey, you know, what would it look like if I was to make a knife of my own? Because um, I, I I had drawn the nimble, being a knife nut, you know, we all kind of have our own, what we think our perfect knife is going to be. And um, so I had, I had sketched the nimble up. And so I sent them some sketches and said, hey, you know, what would it kind of cost to, to do this? Um, and, and I thought it was going to be something that was so far out of reach that that I didn't stand a, a snowball's hope in hell. But it, it it wasn't too bad. I had to make 300 of them the first time. Um, and and so we had to do a pre-order to get funded. And, and thank, thank the Lord we were able to build up enough support. But it... It was crazy because this this thing and this is actually the very first one I decided to grab out of my case. Oh, cool! And um, not perfect. It, it needed some changes. It has a really really kind of high gloss satin that's more of a machine satin, and the blade stock is like two millimeters, which 
is is slicey as all hell but if you're trying to make a fidget friendly knife it's just not it's it see it's just not quite there you can't hit the front flipper as well so i had to kind of tune it up and change change the blade stock change the jimping um and then we did that really nice belt satin finish that we do on them um, as opposed to this really high gloss kind of like if you've ever seen a qsp penguin yes it has that super high kind of almost rainbowy gloss um, to it and, and I'm really happy with the kind of belt satin that we came up with because that wasn't something that QSP had really done before. Um, a lot of things I've done with them are things they haven't done before, which has been kind of fun to, to push them and have them push me back um, because I really came into this from being just, just a layman. Like I wasn't an engineer by trade or a knife designer by trade. I just designed something that, that I would love. And, and it turned out a lot of other people love it too. Yeah, I would say. Uh, so QSP, is this, uh, I know them from the Penguin. I have, actually happen to have one right here. Um, and uh, they're the other knives from their in-house designs. Are you one of their first um, uh, collaboration designers? No, I mean, so they do work for a bunch of folks. They do, I want to say, like all the Finch knives. They do damn, all the damn design stuff. Um, there's a couple other other folks they make knife or they're doing lefties devo knives now mm -hmm. um i think i was the first person and i'm probably wrong but i'm the first one that i know of that wanted to do middle or kind of higher end stuff with them like they were known for doing doing more budget things and so mm -hmm. doing like the nimbles doing the full titanium frame locks with all the nice milling and the higher end finishes i think i was the first person to do that with them and i i didn't just hey, pick QSP and say, hey, you're going to make my knife. Um, I actually ran prototypes of the Nimble with three different shops, and and all three of them are very well known. So I'm not going to say the ones that didn't win because mm -hmm. I don't want to bash them, but because they're they're all excellent people and great shops. It's just that the the product that QSP sent back was just so far above and beyond the competition in that particular instance, um, and and that's I've taken that platform forward so most of my knives have been prototypes or production samples by two to four different oems which is not a cheap way to do it um but i found it to be really effective is because it's not necessarily who who do i want to partner with i want the person that i partner with the shop that i partner with to make me the best version of my knife um and if it's qsp great if it's best tech great if it's riot you know whoever it's going to be um but that's kind of how I've gone forward with my design process. Do you think as you move forward with this, um, you know, because the nimble, which we're talking about right now was your first design. Mm -hmm. um, is that a process you want to keep carrying forward through? I know uh, you, we'll talk about the thick boy, but uh, for future designs and such, uh, are you going to have other um, numerous OEMs kind of uh, uh, prototype you out uh, your design the way you did with the nimble? Or do you think, uh, growing a relationship with one uh, OEM is the way to go. So it's a yes and a no to that. So I think once you've established, like the Nimbles are great. QSP does a fantastic job. So they they own they they make everything Nimble. So if it's the Nimble W, the Nimble X, the the Nimble T that we just did, QSP pretty much owns that collaboration with me. Um, and they, they earned it. They 100% deserve it. And, and I still give them shots at all my other stuff too. And there's, so there's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because building your relationship with your OEM is huge and crucial because they'll, they'll help you out and they'll be kind and, and flexible in some ways after you've built a relationship that, that, uh, you know, I can speak from just from starting out being completely obscure and unknown that the OEMs, they, you know, they have, it's a, a high bar to entry. So once you've established your relationship with them, sometimes you can get them to be a little bit more flexible in certain areas. So it's really important. But also there's the fact that it takes three to five months to, to make a production of knives. Like you're well aware of that stuff. Pe people run pre-orders all the time. It's four or five months out, six months out. And so while you're trying to start a new brand, you want to also be able to build a pace of releases. So I think working with multiple OEMs is, is a good way to go because you can have you know, one shop doing one line of products and another shop doing a separate line of products. Now, I wouldn't have Best Tech make nimbles because then it would kind of blur the lines and get confusing with, you know, with the quality and things like that. Folks wouldn't know who was making what. And But I would have them make the, like the Thick Boy that was made by Best Tech. 
and and they won that build same way i had a couple shops make it and they just sent me the absolute best prototypes and they needed a few changes still but i knew that that was going to work out really really well with them um, and it's funny how you can send the exact same design and specs and everything to two different places and sometimes get almost two completely different looking knives it, and it, it's kind of shocking yeah i guess um after the measurements are followed it's a matter of interpretation or expression you know this is what we've done before this is a solution that will work on this design uh maybe that's kind of how it might work um so with the nimble like um what were your design goals with this and why do you think people love it so much so funny enough i was i was talking to to a friend who was a knife enthusiast and I, the Nimble, I think, was a first in a way. I've got a Nimble T in my hand because uh, it was the closest thing to me in that particular moment. But I, So it has the multiple deployments. And multiple deployments isn't necessarily something new, but I went specifically for Fidget Factor. I'm a bit ADD. I'm a bit all over the place. So I apologize if during the interview I segue a little bit. Um, but the fact that the Nimble was meant to just be a fidget-friendly beast and have such good, nice, reliably smooth action... Um, I think is what made it such a winner. And then it also gives folks, you know, maybe your favorite way of deploying is spidey flicking a knife. So you're going to be able to do that really, really well. Maybe you like the back flipper. Maybe you're a front flipper guy. So you also have all those options on one knife. And I hadn't seen another knife that actually had all those options before the Nimble. Um, I think there are a couple in now. Um, I think Kaiser has one. I can never remember the Cormorant, I want to say. Yeah. Might, might be the one. Yeah. Um, it has a very similar front and back low profile flippers. Yeah. But whether they're low profile or even if it was a standard, you know, pokey pokey flipper, there there are lots of knives coming out now that have multiple deployments. And I still think they either focus on simply having the multiple deployments or they focus still on one of those three, whereas yeah. I focused on all of them and the fact that we wanted to have fidget factor so i think that's to me at least that's why it resonated with so many people the uh the nimble t which you're holding up is probably my favorite version of the nimble since the w i'm a i'm a sucker for the warren cliff but i love your design uh your tonto design here it's really beautiful um and and you're talking about the cormorant that that knife by contrast is ugly as sin as far as yeah my, as far I don't as want to my knock anybody, but it's not my cup of tea. <laughs> no, 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 no. And and you know, it's like uh, you know, some things can be ugly and appealing, and the cormorant has that in spades. I'm not saying it's uh, an unappealing mm -hmm. knife, but but my traditional beauty standards have to have to bend radically to to enjoy that knife. Whereas the nimble or the thick boy, they have there's sort of an inherent uh, uh, beauty to them. Yeah, they have some nice some nice lines to them, yeah. like. So, I mean, you're designed to get those enthusiast elements and get those utilitarian elements in there at the same time and trying to be different, which I'll tell you is not easy mm -hmm. nowadays. Well, what what uh, challenges do you run up against um, in uh, facilitating all of those different ways of opening it? You, uh, in, in addition to those three ways, you can slow roll, presumably with mm -hmm. that whole, all of those require different detent tunings how do you account for that when you're making something with so many different deployment so, options it's like i don't want to give away like the the real secret but it's not the detent everyone oh, okay. thinks it's oh you have this detent it's tuned perfectly for this and this and this well it can only be tuned one way right mm -hmm. it's like i can't tune it differently for each different method of deployment but what you can do is think about where exactly that detent ball is located to to where that you're going to have maximum leverage from no matter which side so the detent ball on this knife is relatively centered to the knife and it's up very high and so mm. when you go to disengage you're on the detent ball pretty much immediately and when you go to flip the knife that's why you have such good leverage from no matter front flipper, back flipper, because no matter where you're pushing on it from, you're pushing from about the same distance mm. from that ball. So is this some is this something you figured out 
on the go or or did you is this something you address because you mentioned before you, you're not a, you're not an engineer and you're an, you're an enthusiast and and you have you know created this like fidget masterpiece um is this uh, is figuring out like where to that that detail you were just explaining about the the location of the detent is that something that you learned in the process you know going from collector to creator so i as much as i'd love to be like oh it's a stroke of brilliance and i knew hey if you put the detent ball right here this is what it's going to do um it was more just the way that i drew the sketch it was completely dumb luck um, and having compared it to other knives with multiple deployments um, and just trying to figure out what was different be because there there's a couple of knives now that have multiple deployments and you think you're they're just they're not they're not gonna just drop they're not they don't feel the same no matter how you deploy them so like the other thing is the nimble feels very much the same it, like the pressure the amount of effort that you have to give regardless of the way that you're opening it um and and other knives and, and specifically there's knives that have tried to be very close to this they don't have that magic and so when i look at them and i look at the nimble that that was one of the things that really stood out to me is okay this is a big difference as far as this particular location and the way it locks up and having that early detail like the second that you move it it's it's on the detent ball right there like when you disengage it it's already up there um so having having an early detent and having it being centered as far as as centered as it can be towards the knife seems to be what balances those things out um i could be wrong but that's <laughs> you, <laughs> it's it's funny because you're like you call it dumb luck but you know what that could be John, it could be talent. You might be a talented knife designer. Never knew it because you were doing other stuff. And now you're doing this and you're discovering that you're actually talented, meaning you've got a little bit of a natural facility for it. You drew it out and, well, wouldn't you know, it works great. <laughs> yeah. uh, so nicely done. Have you have you always been a knife guy and, and collector? No, um, it started it started a few years after my daughter was born. I got into multi-tools. So like I had like a Gerber Crucial and then I had like the um, the uh, I had uh, the Wave from Leatherman and then I had a Skelly tool and uh, I, I liked those and I, I only had like four or five of them. So like I wasn't like re a real nut when I had gotten into them. And then um, I saw for the first time in my life, I saw an OTF knife. Um, when, and I can't remember if it was metal complex, it was a knife review channel, random came across on YouTube, never knew this existed in my life. And I was like, that just looks like magic to me that you can push a button up and it goes up, pull the button down and it goes down. Um, and so I kind of scoured the internet and I bought my first lightning. <laughs> OTF. Yeah. Um, and at that time, I think it was like 30 or $40. And to me, for a pocket knife, that was a lot of money. I was like, that's a lot of money. And I was pretty poor. And so it was also a lot of money. Um, and I loved it. And then so then I got a Microtech. And then yeah, I kind of, you know, stepped things up from there. Um, and I, like in my actual personal knife collection, I, I would say almost 50% of it is, is OTF knives. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be making a new one coming up soon, Ooh. but I, I don't have any, any solid versions to show you, but that is, that's been a goal is to bring, bring the OTF back. The slender man was, was really successful, but I want to do one. That's all me as opposed to doing one where mm. it's just the blade or not me at all. <laughs> right. Um, but well, yes, yeah, that, that got me into knives. That's uh, really exciting for me because I live in Virginia and as of July uh, 1st of this summer, uh, Automatic knives are legal to buy, own, carry, sell, manufacture, all that. And uh, so I'm very excited. That means uh, I'm, I'm uh, kind of going on an out the front and out the side sort of kick. Um, but um, they're just fun. They are. They are. There's there's very little like utility about them. I mean, there's 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 no real reason to have an out the front or to make it an out the front that I can think of uh, being it's a non-military guy. I could think of is if you were in like for police first responder or if you're like in a kind of a rescue situation to have a, a truly one-handed operation where your hands never in the blade path is kind of useful 
but the problem is it has to be quality, like to have a solid feeling lockup. It, so you, you got to have that functionality because having that rattly loose blade can be just as much of a liability with all all the poorly made OTFs that are out there. Right. And I've had great made OTFs that were inexpensive and I've had poorly made OTFs that were overly expensive. So I, it, I mean, it's one like the deadlock, I guess, you know, owns that claim to fame with with zero blade play and i i didn't believe it till i was at blade show this past year and i actually mm -hmm. finally felt one like i knew it was going to be that way because all the all the hype and everyone else i've seen review them but i'm like until you actually experience it and, and to me that's magic because i know how the dang things work and that's and even having seen the internals on that i still can't wrap my head around why it has no blade play like yeah just a little, just a little marble that holds it, that all, all together it feels amazing oh yeah i know and it feels it has a real special feeling when you open that up i mean just uh the the action inside your hand feels awesome i want one i, I still can't get it and they actually won't ship them even though in washington state now they're they're legal to own not carry uh -huh. and then it's like a municipality thing and they're legal to manufacture which is why i can finally bring them back um but the um I lost my train of thought there. Uh, you were talking about bringing them into Washington. Um, so they're legal to legal to own, not carry. And then you can, I totally lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. Well, okay. So you, you, um, you're kind of at this collecting that you're, you're, you're upping your collection game because that's what we all do. Uh, oh, one, yeah. th one thing leads to another and then, and then uh, you find yourself in a sticky situation during the pandemic and you go for it. Um, you have the nimble design. That's what you start with. How did you, uh, I know that you said that you were contacting OEMs due to, uh, the fact that you were trying to start a, a, um, a retailer, yeah. but, but when you decided to actually make knives instead of buy and sell them, uh, wholesale or, or buy them wholesale and sell them, how did you go about doing it? Did you have any mentors? Did you have anyone to show you the way or did you just uh, hack through so, it? I, I reached out like I hadn't been on Instagram for very long. Like, I started my first and I was never social media person. So like my Facebook page for even for the business is pretty atrocious. So anyone on Facebook, <laughs> I apologize. I don't I don't really do much there. I, I have an Instagram page and I'm very active on um, but I had, so I had started following, you know, some makers on Instagram and learning what the hell a hashtag was. Like I was very illiterate to all this stuff. And, um, so I reached out to some makers that I really like, like, uh, Daryl Kasten. Shoot, I should have grabbed one of his knives out of my collection. Cause a couple of his stuff is actually what inspired me. Everybody thinks that it was like, it was like Vero that inspired the nimble. And, you know, while I love his designs and I think that our flipper tabs look very close, it was actually the, um, Maxim X from D rocket, which has a very similar low profile flipper. And even has a fuller that has a little bit of that same kind of oval shape. Like mm -hmm. I got some of the language just from one of my favorite knife makers, but I reached out to, to knife makers in the community. Um, a lot of them, you know, bless them anyway, are not there. They will not share anything, um, which is fine. You know, they don't know who they're talking to, um, but a few of them did say, hey, you know, this has been my experience. This is who I would steer clear of. This is where I would go. Best Tech was highly recommended um, and QSP was recommended by, by one of them. And um, so, you know, taking on some recommendations, even uh, one of them gave me a contact for someone and said, hey, tell them I sent you because right now we're in the middle of pandemic. They're not a lot of OEMs aren't taking work like we wasn't taking new work for a little while during the pandemic. Best Tech wasn't taking new work. Wow. Um, so he was it wasn't necessarily the best time to be going into it. Um, but QSP was hungry for work. So I think they're really trying to to hit the OEM scene. I know they're taking on a lot of new clients, especially after the success of the Nimble. I think folks are taking them a little bit more seriously um, because they can do they can do really good work. And a lot of it just like people didn't realize that. Um, so I reached out and I, I just asked for advice and acted on it. That's that's awesome. I mean, that's the best way to go. If you can get some sort of guidance, some sort of mentorship from someone who's just gone through it or is going through it or help paved pave the way to that process. This is sort of an ongoing, evolving process I've been observing uh, just in speaking with people like yourself, you know, um, inspired people with designs who go to OEMs um, to have their knives made and then distribute them in various ways. Um, how do you go about your distribution and how, how is that tied to the pre-order scheme? 
So for the the first the first pre-order we ran was on one of the OTFs, and it was after we'd seen success with the the, the early OTF kind of had caught on the one that I didn't design. And then I did the Warncliffe design with that. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to try to run a pre-order so I can get this at least partially funded, if not wholly funded. Um, the way I've taken the attitude with my projects is if I don't have enough to fully fund the production, I, I wouldn't even start a pre-order. So I usually chunk half down or more to get the production started because they require pretty sizable deposits. And then you have that other, you know, 50%, 40%, 60%, depending on whatever the, the manufacturer, um, what their contract terms are, and you have to make up that gap. Um, I always have it covered, so I'm not dependent on the pre-orders, but what the pre-orders have done for me is make it possible. So like if I was running a pre-order on the OTF, that pre-order money was actually funding the Nimble project because this was already, I was already good to go on this one. And that way, like, because when I'm just starting out, I think I have like a thousand or maybe 2000 followers, maybe not very many. Mm -hmm. So to think that I was going to sell out this, like I, I didn't want to bank on it. And what if only 20, 30 people bought a knife? I have to be able to deliver those knives. So I never wanted to be in a position where I had to worry about letting somebody down um, because, you know, I'm trying to start a business. You got to build a name for yourself. And especially if you're running pre-orders, trust is paramount. And if you screw up, you're going to break your supporters trust and they're never going to come back. I mean, even having your pre-order deadlines go farther um, than they're supposed to is something I try to steer clear from. And I've so far with all the pre-orders and things we've done, we've had one that, that went oh, well over what it was supposed to go. And that was the liner locks. And that it was honestly, cause QSP has never done a nested liner lock or titanium liner lock before. So they simply underquoted the time it took to make them. Oh. It's just one of those, one of those nature of the business things when you're in unknown territory. So how how do you how did you find in that particular experience people reacted? Uh, you know what? Uh, pretty much all my supporters have been absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, you'll get you'll get the onesie twosies that that will get a little irritated. And if you know if we blow a deadline and someone's upset and if they want out, then I'll, I'll just let them out. Like that, it just is what it is. I I broke the deadline. Um, thankfully, it's only happened once, and and it seems to be the the folks that have followed us and supported us have genuinely like meant that support. They really love what we're doing, and they're really excited about the knives. And that's probably one of my favorite things about this whole business is that you know I'm I'm a collector and enthusiast myself. Like I I love this stuff, and so getting to see other people love the stuff that I'm making is just absolutely crazy. And I try to make myself accessible and always respond to emails and DMs really quickly so that folks know, like, you know, I, I'm not just here to sell you a knife. If you have a question, I'm going to answer it. And, and sometimes you know, people will call up on the phone. I'll answer it. I'll talking to them for 30, 40 minutes. And half the time we're like talking about our kids <laughs> or something like that, not <laughs> yeah. just the knives. So um, on your website, I was reading up and I know you said you don't like your website, but uh, look good to me. Uh, but I was reading a portion where you say that uh, where you're talking about receiving prototypes from different OEMs and testing them out. And uh, you 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 mentioned that you run them through kind of a battery of tests. What kind of things do you do uh, to test these prototypes? I know <clears throat> I know you're going to go with the one that's built the best that feels the most like what you envisioned in your design. But in terms of testing and performance, uh, how do you how do you judge there? So the, the first, the first thing that I'm going to do when I, when I get a, a, a prototype in hand, and here's this is a prototype of the relative is I, I'm going to look at it at, from a, a purely aesthetic viewpoint is going to be the, the first thing uh, I'm going to see. How does the texturing on the milling feel? How, how do, how do the, the lines on the grind mm -hmm. look and how does, how is the whole profile of the knife from, from tip to tail? And then, if all of those things are right, then we're going to see, you know, how is, how is the action on it? Is the action going to be as snappy? What are the acoustics sound like? And once we've gotten those simple, basic things that you can just tell just by going over and feeling and listening to the knife and, and checking out the textures, then I'm going to go on, I'm going to cut some stuff. I'm going to break down some boxes. I'm going to cut some paper. Uh, I'm going to stab it into a piece of wood really freaking hard. Um, I'm probably going to destroy one of them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. in the process um because i want to make sure it's also built built tough because they may be pretty but 
there are people that are going to use these as tools. There are plenty of people that are going to collect my knives and they're never going to do anything more than be an Amazon opening ninja. But <laughs> there are folks that are actually going to go and do real stuff with them. So, you know, as pretty as some of them are, they need, they will hold up and they will take on the task. Um, but, but mainly the first thing is going to be aesthetics because of the, the part of the market that I'm in. It has to, it has to look exactly like how I imagined in my head that it was going to look when we created it. So how would you define the part of the market that you're in? Um, so I, I would say that I'm in that, I guess, boutique or like middle mid range designer market where we're not ultra high end, like custom knives that are going to be 900 or a thousand dollars. I, you know, that's not really the goal or the dream. Um, we're kind of, I'm trying to kind of hover around that 300 or less for the most part. Um, there's going to be some knives that I'm doing that are going to be a little bit more than 300. And if you get them in a crazy setup, like you're getting Zerkatai everything and stuff like that, then there's, there's going to be obviously a, a top that you can go to, but if you want to get yourself into a nimble, you're, you're generally going to be, you know, 275, 299. I mean, and when I do pre-orders, I always do a discount. Some of them, I do big discounts, like 50, $60 um, for the pre-order. Well, cause the people that come out for the pre-order, those are the folks that are really keeping the lights on and right, right. let me launch into new products. So just like I told you, the pre-orders, they fund the new stuff and I love making new stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you're talking about acoustics. Now, how important is the sound of a knife? I mean, we know that it's important, but uh, to those who, who might not know, how important is the sound of a knife? And and will you actually, I mean, of course, that's all that's all in the eye of the, the ear of the beholder. Mm -hmm. And um, and to some people, it might not be important. But if you're going through a knife, for instance, and everything else is on point, but for some reason, it doesn't sound the way you want it to. Are you going to tweak due to that? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and absolutely. What, are you, what are you looking for and why? So I'm looking for a nice, solid click, like just nice and snappy. Like I, I like them to not be like when you open the knife, I want you to know, even with the, even with the nimble, you're going to get a nice snappiness uh, if i could have them all sound the same i would the relative God. you're gonna get a nice yeah. nice snap and and that's something that i search for in in all of the knives and so if a prototype comes in and it doesn't have a nice nice authoritative pop when you open it then it it needs a change it might need a stronger detent it, it might need any number of things to change that um so far just the way that I, I seem to design them, it seems to be a byproduct of that, that we get pretty good acoustics. Um, and then the ones that don't have a good acoustic, it's usually something to do with the clothes and that, and it's typically, it'll actually be a defect where like the detent hole isn't actually drilled deep enough and maybe the ball is touching. So you get, you ever heard it have one when you shut it, it gives you that little kind of zzz, little vibration. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. So like the, the whole, the detent ball is actually touching the bottom of the hole and bouncing around. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I get that. <laughs> um, you know what I noticed, uh, John, is that when titanium knives started to, they really started, manufacturers started focusing on weight relief and milling yep. out pockets. That really started changing the sound of knives. I remember the, the zero tolerance, the Les George designed zero tolerance 940 based on his Harpy model was was loud there was no way to like quietly or discreetly open that knife unless you like popped it open in your hand and then slowly opened it up by hand and it was because of the aggressive internal milling i think that was the first time first knife i had had that had anything like that and um yeah so uh so would you would you alter the acoustics through milling is that another option uh, so far the only way that i have done it was by just changing the way that the lock bar was actually cut so it just engaged differently um like i don't like i said i'm not an engineer so actually like now that you say that the um the internal like there's a lot of internal milling on this one's probably impossible to see on that camera maybe you can see it yeah no, yeah, i can you, see you it. can see yeah. it in there um so i mean that that may be giving you that nice solid thwack um but I think it's also just the way that the knife hits 
and the lock engages at the same time. Um, I also on everything but the the thick boy, everything is riding on floating stop pins that have you know tracks, mm. so that mm -hmm. stop pins are are attached to the blade because that gives you really good lateral strength. And I feel like that the stop pins whacking while the blade while the locks engaging also gives you that really nice snappiness. Right, it's like a double impact. Yeah, making it X. Yeah, that's that's very gratifying uh th so the knife you just had up in hand this is a prototype uh yes. tell me about this knife this is this I, I think this one takes the cake so far it you know i like i tend to like large knives i tend to like rather aggressive looking knives it's just kind of my taste and this one is seems to be fitting that bill quite nicely let's see if i can get it in frame here. So the, the relative uh, the and the, the silly reason for that name is because if you, if you can't see it right away um, it has some very similar lines and shapes to a nimble, but but it's not a nimble in that it doesn't have all the different opening mechanisms. Um, so this is kind of a spinoff from the nimble sheep's foot. Um, initially, the way that I had drawn it up was like a sh was a straight clip point, and then I asked I asked one of my OEMs if they could mock it up as a Bowie, and I kind of just redrew that little front profile and then kind of i sketched in this compound hollow grind and i'm like can we can we try this and get this kind of ultra aggressive looking knife uh it's 3.4 inches and this one's something special because it's going to be at least the style that's in my hand is going to be uh magna cut so there's mm. going to be 200 of this exact version in magna cut and then we're going to have like 150 of these guys in CPM 20 CV. And then some, I'm doing like 50 of PBD blacked out ones that are going to be in 20 CV as well. Oh, that's exciting. Uh, I, I really, yeah, I like the look of that knife. I, I think, um, so between all of the nimble versions and the thick boy and, um, and the relative, uh, I, I think I'm seeing your design language uh, emerge. It, you seem to have a pretty strong voice. And and it seems between the three of those, and I know there are other iterations, but just looking at your work, I think you can tell that it's your work. And I think that that's pretty cool because just because you're passionate about something and just because you work hard at something doesn't mean you necessarily have a style. And just because you want to have a style doesn't mean you're going to have one if you try and force it. I don't know. I'm seeing something organic uh emerge it seems like uh it's all coming out of the same head and it is obviously i mean there's a few things I, I try to squeeze in to each one like i am a big fan of big pocket clips because you can do fun things with them you can make them fun colors you can make them fun materials mm. um and so like having this nice swooping pocket clip uh having a man-sized finger choil <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh long jimping and then obviously the the oval thumb hole with the ball chamfering is always something that I'm going to be doing. And you're going to see that whether it's an OTF knife, whether it's a folding knife, you're always going to see most of those elements. Like you may not see a bunch of jimping on an out the front knife, but you'll for sure see the same thumb hole. You'll for sure see a similar pocket clip. Um, and so I think coming up with your own style as a, a creator or designer is it's super important, but you're right that it can't be forced. Be, I mean, there's times when I've sat down and tried to, like, oh, I'm going to sketch out a, you know, a Bowie knife, or I'm going to sketch out, um, say, like a new drop point, and I want it to be a front flipper, or you know, actually, I have a good example here. Let me grab one that didn't, that did not work out. It looks really cool, but it did not work out. Let me see where I put that. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, we're all right familiar here. with that, with that kind it of scenario. Did, it did not work out the way that I initially planned it to. Um, and so like right now, this one is kind of sidelined. Um, it started off, I was going to call it, um, the Ronin, but someone that I know recently launched a knife called the Ronin. So then I was like, Oh, I'll call it the Swift or I'll call it the Agile. Ooh. Naming something is also really freaking hard. Yeah. Don't realize that, uh, because you want the name to resonate with the project, but you also want it to be interesting and engaging and intriguing at the same time. Um, so this one, currently the name is sitting at Swift, which I'm not. I'm not completely sold on, um, but it is a my first try at just pretty much a, a predominantly front flipper, um, and you're supposed to be able to have the thumb hole access on there. That's now, cool. It, it looks it looks cool. Don't get me wrong. I, I but 
it's not it's not quite right it's like i, I tried to fort this pocket clip it's just not quite right the the jimping on it it looks good but it's not quite right and and the part that that kills me the most on this right now is that the thumb hole access is just terrible yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as pretty as as pretty as i tried to get all those features in there uh, and and the man size finger toil <laughs> yeah. um, it just it didn't work out like i love this knife i'm going to come back to it at a certain point um and try to refine it uh and make something with it but for 2022 um the relative is going to be our last new offering as far as as far as anything different um and then i, I kind of want to focus on making you know more of of the spear point nimbles uh, bring back the nimble tees for a second, go around, um, things like this to, to try to make my knives more available for folks. I don't want them to have to wait, you know, a year for every single knife or eight months for every single knife. I want to try to get to a more regular uh, tempo with them, um, not to the point where they become irrelevant, but just to the point where people can get a hold of them in a reasonable time frame without having to go to the secondary market. And I've seen people pay just ridiculous amounts. For my knives like i'm flattered and irritated at the same time <laughs> yeah sure yeah i could see that uh in in equal turn flattered and irritated it's like uh what i i did notice uh you you did put out well i didn't notice it uh you put out a, a nested liner lock version you were saying that you had a little bit of difficulty that was the one that was the the uh yep the the delayed uh release and such uh but how did that go over uh presumably is less expensive it's maybe easier to get behind a john rusk design when it's made like that uh were those popular options yeah the the liner lock did really really well on the pre-order um my goal was to sell about 50 percent of the production for the pre-order and and we did uh it took about i want to say six days five days something like that wow. um that's the other thing, and I'm going to segue, and I'll come right back to it. Is um, there's this big thing in the in the in the smaller maker knife community where sometimes I think um, either supporters or even I think sometimes the makers themselves don't think maybe it's successful if your pre-order doesn't sell out in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've ha though I've had that happen where like you know it's an amazing thing to experience and to see people that hungry for the things that you're making. Um, and it's incredible at the same time, when I, when that did happen, that told me one thing, I did not make enough knives. Um, and I left people out there frustrated that didn't have a chance to get them. So mm. my goal was to at least scale up to the point where my minimum, my pre-orders should last two to three days. And the goal is about a week. Like I want people to have, and, and that way, if someone wants to say, oh, I, I couldn't get your knives. They're never available. Well, they were available for seven days. Before, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, I can't make them available forever, but I'm trying to give folks at least a reasonable amount of time to get a hold of them. You um, know, I think, I think that, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's got to be very well appreciated because, um, you know, sometimes life gets ahead of you and you're not aware of, of that drop that you really want to get in on. And you might need a couple of days to sell off a knife or two to fund it. You know, we don't, we're not all made of money. And, um, you know, your knives are not inexpensive. No. And, and it, because they fit in that, in that niche we were discussing, that market niche we were discussing, the boutique thing. Um, so, so some people might need a couple of days to raise funds or, you know, um, get themselves ready to make that sort of commitment because um, not everyone is ready to drop. Uh, that money and sometimes like for me when i buy a knife uh of that expense it's a special it feels special it's a good thing and so if you're really excited about an emp edc and you have a chance and you and you've saved up the money and you can grab that knife i mean that that feels even better so leaving that open for a week i think that's a service yeah i mean at the same time though like the way i do the, the pre-orders just like the, with the liner locks is I've already predetermined the amount of knives. I've already ordered them. And I'm probably two months into production before I'm opening up the pre-order to, to shrink that lead time down, which is something I think that my my supporters also appreciate is they're not, they're never waiting six months. Like the, the longest pre-order we've ever had was for the liner locks. And actually these guys start getting shipped tomorrow morning. Um, cool. I, I will be plowing through those into early next week, probably Monday or Tuesday will be the last two days. 
as I finished packing those as we have the drop for the, the uh, Tontos this weekend. Um, so as I'm going to go right from packing the, the liner locks to, to knock on all the Tontos that we sell this weekend out um, to try to push them out, um, which is kind of cool to have so much in-house at once. I literally have three productions all landed on me all at once. We have the wow. Thick Boys, the Nimble Tees, and then the liner locks just got in um, on Monday. Uh, let's talk about the Thick Boy. I love the design. Um, I've, I've held the nimble. I've never held the thick boy, uh, but I think it's beautiful. And you told, you just told us it's made by best tech and yes. they're awesome. I love best tech. Um, tell me about your design goals with that knife and you know, who, what, how people are responding to it. It's so cool. So I, I have, I grab like, this is my personal one that I like to carry. So it's, it's got my little zerk tie clip on it. It's got oh, yeah. the stonewashed finish. And then, so it's a, it's a chunky little pocket cleaver. Um, you know, I have a, I have a couple different pocket cleavers that I've collected. Um, and as much as I love them from the other designers, there were aspects of them I didn't particularly like, or I thought, hey, I, if, if I was going to design the perfect pocket cleaver, um, what would it look like? And it turns out this is what it looks like. Um, <laughs> but the, the first one um, had, it was very nimble-esque. It had a big gap because it, it came to be at a time when I when right after the nimble was successful. And so I was like, how can I make a different version of the nimble? I was thinking about this cleaver design. So initially the thick boy was going to have all of the opening mechanisms as the nimble. Um, but when we finished designing it up, it looked so ugly. Uh, it just, it, it didn't, it did with having the little, the little cutout on the back and then having the high front flip, it, it just with the knife, this, that's this profile, it, it didn't look, it just didn't look right. So we got rid of the back flipper. We got rid of the front flipper and we went for the, just the thumb deploy only, um, Sweet. and ended up with this really gnarly big cleaver blade that it comes down to one hell of a little of an edge yeah. uh, because it's got that tall flat grind. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been cool. The only thing on this knife that was, that was serendipity was uh, the 3d um, backspacer. Originally the, the backspacer was supposed to, to have these notches, but it was going to be flush. Mm -hmm. um, but it was still out of time where, where I'm, designing everything by pencil and then having someone help me convert them to 3d. Um, and so in, in the pencil sketch, it looked a little 3d. And so when I saw the the final 3d version that we had mocked up and I saw it popped up, I thought it looked so freaking cool that I was like, yeah, you know, in prototyping, let's keep the backspacer just like that. And w as soon as I got him in hand, I'm like, this is so freaking cool. And then it's kind of at the same time, it ended up being almost like a throwback to the frag pattern on the nimble. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Speaking as a very shallow yeah. guy who loves the way things look, I, I do love the way the, the uh, backspacer looks uh, sitting proud like that. But also I've been noticing how useful that kind of texture in that spot in particular uh, can be, especially when, um, you know, opening a knife of almost any opening method, having jumping right there is a pretty valuable thing oh it gives you some awesome grip in the back palm of your hand it really does and i and the other funny thing is that this I, I catch a lot of crap from some people like you know the they'll look at the oh that pocket clip so huge it, the thing the thing is it's not a hot spot the way that they go into the curve of your hand this it, it might look like a big gnarly pocket clip on this or the nimble but you don't when you're holding the knife you do not really feel it unless you're concentratingly trying to know it's there um it's not pokey pokey like a right. lot of the the gooseneck clips you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah and, and uh, yeah i do and i looking at that one it looks comfortable um it doesn't look the only reason i would say that that looks big to some eyes might be on the jeans if someone's trying to carry something super discreet you know, like a wire clip or something. You might look at that and think it's got a big footprint, but um, otherwise it looks like it's comfortable in hand. Sometimes you can tell like, uh, um, well, uh, also not naming names. You can look at some 
uh, popular designers clips and they look uncomfortable and indeed they are. And then they, yep. they go and tweak them and stuff like that. But um, I feel like you can kind of tell. Uh, what what has been the reaction to the thick boy? Uh, we know uh, how people how the knife world has responded to the nimble. What has been the response to the to the thick boy? So the original thick boy there was, and I don't whether you're aware or not. There was a little bit of a, of a controversy. It looked similar to someone else's knife, oh. um, and it's just one of those things where I had never heard of the person. I'm not going to name names or really bring up drama, but I'm designing my own stuff. I didn't come out here to, to do anything but my own thing um, and just love creating things and sharing it with the community and sharing it with the folks that support me. And so the Thick Boy, um, the first time we did it, it was kind of a mixed um, reception because there was a little bit of drama right before the launch for the pre-order. It, it seemed like there was a really high amount of interest and then it kind of fizzled a little bit right at the end. And I think for the first period, we sold about 50% of them. And then when we had the drop, um, we sold most of them. And then it took, a, it took a few weeks to, to get through that entire production. And the, the Thick Boy V2, same kind of thing. When we had the, the launch this past weekend, we sold a little over half of them. Um, and then now every day it's, you know, 10, 15, 20, um, and they'll be gone in, in a week or two. And then that'll be that. So it's not one that's been a huge, like giant fast seller, um, and I also think it's a polarizing design, you know, aside from that little bit of drama that happened, it's, it's a pocket cleaver and not everybody looks at this and goes, you know what, that's going to be the most useful thing that I can buy for $300. Uh, right, right. <laughs> yeah. It's something, yeah. if you like cleavers, then you'll love it. If, if you're not a big into pocket cleavers, then meh. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. It seems like a pocket cleaver connoisseur's, uh, dream to me. I look at that and, uh, uh, where a pocket cleaver like the um, the Kaiser Sheepdog, I love the way it looks, <laughs> but I kind of feel like I'll never get one because it does not have a point. But I look at the Thick Boy, and one of the things I like about it is it can indulge my cleaver curiosity, but it still offers a point. You know, it's got a point that you could uh, thrust into a, a, a clamshell, thick clamshell package without any issue and and plus i also find the point on any knife to be part of what is attractive to me yeah i mean stabby things should be stabby in my, in my thank opinion you. thank you i mean <laughs> and, and you can do some damage it's it it may be big and chunky but it anything you hit that with it's gonna go right right in yeah i i think that one of my buddies he cole over at try he because this this knife is slicier than it has any right to be <laughs> <laughs> You use a bolster lock on this on this knife too, which is uh, something that I love. Yep, I use a bolster lock. Um, I did so we did for the stock versions. You get micarta inlays, and then something that I like to do with my projects. I, you, I don't know if you've picked up on it, but I like to provide customization. So like yes. we did G10 scales, other micarta scales, um, brass, copper, mokutai, zirkatai. Um, and, and they're not crazy. Well, the Mokutai and Zirkatai is a little expensive, but like, if you want to get into the other ones, they're like 20 bucks, 25 bucks. You know, it's not, I don't focus on the side stuff like that. That's not where, that's not what pays the bills. Like if, if I'm doing different color pocket clips or if I'm doing the scales and stuff like that, I'm just, they're pretty much done for fun and for everybody to be able to customize their knife and make it the way they want it. Um, it's just a side aspect of the business that is more like a passion project than it is meant to to like capitalize if that makes sense yeah yeah sure to me that's the collector enthusiast in you uh speaking up in the relate in the uh in the business relationship with the others you know with the business self you know you know john if you were collecting these knives you would want extra pocket clips you would want extra scales so let's offer this to the people and it, and at a, and at a reasonable price, like it doesn't, they don't have to be like I I see folks that that sell with just a pocket clip for one hundred and seventy five dollars and things like that, and knowing what they cost to produce seems just why <laughs> like why yeah, would you yeah. Use that? <laughs> because you know if you get a hot nut for a new clip or something like that, you're most people who are thinking that way in the first place aren't going to let it go until they have that new pocket clip. So there, there's your opportunity to price gouge, but uh, thankfully you don't do that. So what are you hoping or what are you aiming, I should say, 
Uh, where are you aiming EMP EDC uh, for the future? What kind of company do you want it to be when it's at its full maturation? And what's your vision? So the, the original vision was to spend the first one to three years growing it and kind of having it be controlled pretty much solely in-house uh, where I keep it, where the productions are at a manageable size, where like I can still hands on every single knife, like every single knife that gets packed and goes out the door has gone through my hands. I'm not perfect. Once in a while, I'll miss one, but we just take care of the people and make it right. Uh, but that allows me to have really, really strict quality controls on what goes out into the world and growing it and building our reputation and just building people's general awareness that we're here because we're still very small and very unknown. And then starting to slowly take on retail partners um, and look to do some other fun things. So like, like we're taking on our first uh, retail partner with Urban EDC. Coming in up in October, we're going to do a Segeha pattern nimble launch with them. And those are those are coming up. A what pattern? Nimble? You know how they do that, the wave pattern on a lot of their stuff? Oh, yes, here, yes, yes. I'll grab one. I got one handy here. Oh, cool. Let me see. Sorry, I was trying not to give you a crotch shot. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's all right. Jim cut to me. That's. <laughs> yeah. But... um. So we have it has that that really nice milling pattern. Oh wow, that it. is and a it's, knockout it's a frame lock. So we're doing we're doing a hundred of these with them, and they'll be available exclusively through Urban EDC. And then we have our other new stuff that I'll be dropping. So we're doing like a four hole pattern that's got a um, it's going to be a, a DLC black handle with uh, four speed holes that are blue anodized on the inside. Mm. Uh, and there's some other cool stuff that we're doing with the nimble project uh, but slowly taking on some retail partners um, and being thoughtful in the way that we do it and then eventually um, getting big enough to where i have to actually get some commercial some small commercial space that i can have a couple employees come help me with the fulfillment stuff like that i don't want this to be a mega company um, that's not my goal I, my goal isn't to make all these billions and millions uh, like for the first year, I, I wanted to do like a thousand orders and we did about 2000 orders. Um, for this year, my goal was 5,000 orders and we're sitting at about 4,000 right now. So we should be, we should be right on track to hit that. Um, which is crazy to, to see that kind of growth, um, going from obscurity to can't keep up <laughs> with, with things. Um, but that's th the general goal is to just continue to, to grow it um in one direction let slowly and thoughtfully i don't want to grow explosively because i feel like that's how companies get burned out yeah yeah and it seems like you need to you you need time to grow as it's growing so that you have something to offer you know you, yes. you don't want you don't want to you don't want all of that heaped on you all that responsibility of being a a, a giant and perpetual success heaped on you too early where you don't have the you know I, 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 I admire the way you're going about it kind of in a, in a, in a uh, slow and thoughtful way, but at the same time, you're also working to never be without product. And I think that seems to be from what I've gathered through many conversations similar to this is that always having product on hand for someone who's doing yep. it, going about it the way you're doing it, it is a, is a big challenge. It's, it, it's my biggest problem. For, for the business was the, like, if you, you know, you go to my website right now, I have thick boys in stock and I'm not sad about that. Like, it's nice that if somebody goes to my website right now, there are, you can get a, you can get a rock and robot knock, you get a thick boy. And I think I have some patches up right now. Um, but the, the goal is to eventually have something available at all times. And I'm not going to have all things available at all times, but maybe I'll have some nimbles available all always here and there maybe it's stick boys maybe it's maybe it's a new knife coming up but i want this site to have somewhere between two and five products available at all times so that we can just have nice consistent sales um you know one thing that it's, it's like a thing that people don't talk about in this industry when you run pre-orders and things like that your your sales are spike drop spike drop mm. spike drop banks and credit card processors don't like that <laughs> If they right, see that right. and they go, what in the world are you doing that you had last week, you had $500 in sales and this week you had holy crap in sales in one day. Um, they, they, you get a lot of, you start a lot of questions. And once you, once you establish a, a, a pattern that goes away, but when you're just starting out, we went through hell 
when we just started out the first couple of times my products went viral the banks call us up what's going on with your account our credit card processors you know why why is everything the same price well because everybody bought the same item <laughs> but, uh, wow <laughs> That's the question that we got. And I know I'm not alone because I've had conversations with other makers and, you know, folks that have had trouble finding payment processors and stuff, because when you sell knives, they consider it a weapon, even mm -hmm. though it's a tool, just like anything else. And people are, most people are going to use them properly. And there are people that are going to abuse them and misuse them, but I'm not responsible for that. And that's not the goal here, especially not when you're selling stuff that's aimed at your more collector and enthusiast crowd. Those, you know, aren't the folks who are going to go out and run amok with these things. Right, right. But people tend to, to they'll, they'll, they'll do it with the EMP EDC cheap kitchen knife. That's what they'll run amok with, but not with their <laughs> nimbles. They're going to keep those under glass. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining me on the Knife Junkie podcast. Let everyone know, uh, besides the website where they can get, uh, currently can get a thick boy replacement scales, patches, the knuck, and some other things. Uh, but tell people the best way to keep up with you and uh, new developments with EMP EDC. So we, uh, we have a newsletter you can sign up for on our site. If you just go to the homepage, it's going to be in the top quarter. You'll see newsletter. Make sure you guys sign up for that because we do releases sometimes that I will only just send a newsletter out for. And I won't, I won't mention them on Instagram. I won't mention them anywhere else because it could be a small amount of product or things like that. And then, of course, if you're on Instagram, follow us on Instagram. Turn your notifications on. Uh, it's at EMP EDC. Um, I do a lot of product updates there, too, as well as projects. So if you jump in on a pre-order and things like that. You'll get regular updates through Instagram and through email so that you'll kind of know, hey, what's going on with the projects and the products that we sell. Awesome. Well, again, thank you, John, so much for uh, joining us on the Knife Junkie podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome, man. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. Take care. Do you carry multiple knives? Then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Uh, great talking with John Rusk of EMP EDC. I love the way he's going about it. Uh, like I mentioned, kind of, uh, kind of cautious and thoughtful, yet always a wash in product. And, and we know what that product is. It's knives and we love knives. So, uh, go check out EMP EDC on Instagram and follow them. There are lots of great pictures and you can Always keep your eye on the drops there. All right. Please uh, be sure to join us next Sunday for another interview. And Wednesday, of course, for the midweek supplemental. And Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And then also, uh, if you haven't had a chance to finish this uh, podcast, you, you're not hearing me now anyway. But you can download this to the podcast apps and listen on the go. I highly recommend it. All right. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.